This is the Bible Explained by Pastor Michael Yo. Before we begin, let us prepare our hearts through worship. God of creation, there at the start before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of the And as you speak
Shalom and welcome to our Bible study on the book of James again. And before we go further, let's have a quick recap of our last session on enduring faith. Now, taking our lesson from James chapter 5, verse 10 to 11, uh, we learn that number one, when you suffer in your service for the Lord, uh, follow the example of the prophets who patiently endure. And number two, when you face trials for no apparent reason, consider Job and trust in God's compassion and mercy. And if you miss any of these uh, lessons, uh, please check it out on our church Facebook page or YouTube channel. It is always available on demand. And today, we have another great lesson for you entitled, Truthful Communication. Now, a boy was on the witness stand in an important lawsuit. The prosecuting attorney cross-examined him and then delivered, he thought, a crushing blow to the boy's testimony. He said, Your father has been telling you how to testify, hasn't he? Yes, the boy didn't hesitate with the answer. And now, said the lawyer triumphantly, just tell us how your father told you to testify. Well, the boy said modestly, Father told me that the lawyers would try to tangle me in my testimony, but if I would just be careful to tell the truth, I could repeat the same thing every time. Now, James 5.12 says this, But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Now, in some countries, if you are ever called on to testify in court, you will be asked, Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. So, the question is, are you violating scripture to put yourself under such an oath? Now, some Christians would answer yes, but I would be among those who would say no. And the reason is we just need to be clear 
on the meaning of James' command in our text, which repeats Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Now, these words go beyond taking of oaths or vows. They deal with the issue of truthful speech or communication. There is a crisis of truth in our culture. Many do not even believe there is such a thing as absolute truth. And added to that, politicians, contractors, salesmen are notorious for promising things that they know they can never deliver. Now, with every broken promise, distrust increases and the fabric of our society unravels a bit more. And it is in this scenario, it is all the more a priority for Christians to walk the talk and keep our words and promises. If we make a promise to a customer in our business, we should keep our word even if it costs us. If we promise our children something, we should do what we promise. Now, in our everyday communication, we should speak the truth and not shade it with nuances to hide the truth. To understand James 5 verse 12 better, we must understand how the Jews of that day were using oaths. Oaths were supposed to foster truthful communication. But in reality, they had become a facade for lying. The Jews said that if you swore upon God's name in your oath, you had to keep your word. But if you swore by some lesser thing, Jerusalem, for example, or the temple or whatever, you were not bound. You can read about how Jesus confronts this in Matthew chapter 23. Now, we will consider James' teaching today under four headings. Number one is that Christians must work at truthful communication. James say, but above all. Now, is James saying that refraining from swearing or taking an oath really more important than anything else he has said thus far? Probably not. Oaths are necessary because bending the truth for personal advantage comes naturally to us as sinners. And in speaking of the depravity that is common to the human race, Paul says in Romans 3, with their tongues they keep deceiving. You don't have to teach a little child to lie. Rather, you have to teach him to tell the truth, especially when it is seemingly not to his advantage to do so. So take note that James is not speaking here to those outside of the church, but rather to believers. He says, my brothers. Now, becoming a Christian does not automatically produce truthful communication. The Bible is filled with exhortations to God's people to be truthful in word and in deed. Ephesians 4.25 says, Therefore, having put away every falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. And in 1 Peter 3.10, For whosoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. So don't assume that because we are Christians, we won't struggle with the sin of being deceptive. We all need to work at truthful communication. 
The second thing is this, the Bible does not prohibit all oaths, but it does restrict them. When James says, do not swear, he is not referring to taking the Lord's name in vain. Rather, he is talking about not invoking God's name in everyday speech to assure the truthfulness of what you say. Our words should be true without needing to say, I swear to God that it is true. But the Bible does teach that there are certain occasions when it is proper to take an oath or make a vow before God. And Deuteronomy 10.20 says, You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve Him and hold fast to Him, and by His name you shall swear. Now in the New Testament, the only time that Jesus spoke in His trial before the council was when the high priest said to Him in Matthew 26, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to Him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, Jesus replied the high priest under oath. And the apostle Paul often swore by the Lord when he said, God is my witness. Now, even more significantly, God sometimes swears by himself, either by his words or by enacting his covenant. He swore to David with an oath that one of his descendants would always sit on his throne. And so the Bible does not prohibit all oaths. Rather, it forbids both frivolous and false oaths. Now, frivolous oaths are those that are so commonplace that they lose all significance or meaning. And the other kind of oath that the Bible forbids is the false oath. A false oath is one that the person making it does not intend to keep, but he makes it either to impress or to deceive others. And Jesus and James were directing these commands towards these kinds of oaths. The Jews had elaborate rules that if you swore by the temple, you were not bound by your oath, but if you swore by the goal of the temple, you were bound. Now it was kind of like, I really did not mean what I said. To sum up, the Bible does not prohibit all taking of oaths or vows, but it does restrict them to important occasions. And when we do take an oath, we need to consider it carefully, prayerfully. And then we need to be conscientious enough to follow through. If we are unable to keep our word, we should confess it to God and to the person we have wronged. And we should seek to make restitution in ways that reflect genuine repentance. The third observation is that the real issue at stake is, again, truthful communication. In commenting on Matthew chapter 5, Haddon Robinson says, with regard to the Sermon on the Mount, if anger was the real issue of murder, lust the real issue of adultery, selfishness the real issue of divorce, then deceit is the real issue of oath. Jesus wasn't addressing whether or not we should take an oath. He was talking about whether or not we are truthful. We don't tell the truth because we have taken an oath. We tell the truth because we are truthful. Truthful communication is essential for good relationships because truth is essential for trust. And if you don't trust someone, you are not going to allow that person to get close to you. We lie or deceive others because we mistakenly think that it will hold the relationship together. So we rationalize 
bending the truth, thinking if she really knew the truth, she would never speak to me again. But that's like trying to fix a broken pipe with masking tape. You may slow the leak temporarily, but you are only delaying disaster. The pipe will burst and cause far more damage than if you have just fixed it properly when the leak was first detected. If we practice deception in our relationships, we may preserve superficial peace on the surface, but beneath the surface, a volcano is building. When the truth is revealed, the volcano will erupt and cause far more damage than if we had honestly dealt with the root issues when they first came up. So the root of truthful communication is walking truthfully before God who sees your heart. Truthful communication is something that takes us all in. If Abraham lied about Sarah and David lied about Bathsheba and Peter lied about knowing Jesus Christ, then none of us are exempt from temptation to this sin. So work at becoming a person of truthful communication. And James ends with a warning. If we engage in boastful, deceptive speech or false oaths, we will fall under judgment. Judgment is a significant issue for James. He just said in verse 9, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged because the judge is standing at the door. And he's talking to Christians, brothers, not to unbelievers. And so, how will Christians fall under judgment? Now, Jesus said in John 5.24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. Now, Paul wrote in Romans 8 verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, with regard to eternal judgment and salvation, those who have truly trusted in Christ do not need to fear. Having said that, Paul warns the Corinthians that we will be judged for our works and conduct and behaviour. 1 Corinthians 3 says, If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And Paul later explains to the same church that they needed to judge themselves before partaking of the Lord's Supper so that they would not be judged. 1 Corinthians 11 says, Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And that is why many of you are weak and you, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Now, in other words, Christians can also fall under God's judgment, which may result in severe divine discipline, including even physical illness and even death. Now, as we conclude this lesson on truthful communication, let us consider what William Buckley has to say. And he wrote these words, Here is a great eternal truth. Life cannot be divided into compartments, in some of which God is involved and in others of which He is not involved. There cannot be one kind of language in the church and another kind of language in the shipyard or factory, or the office. There cannot be one kind of standard 
of conduct in the church and another kind of standard in the business world. The fact is that God does not need to be invited into certain departments of life and kept out of others. He is everywhere, all through life and every activity of life. He hears not only the words which are spoken in His name. He hears all words and there cannot be any such thing as a form of words which evades bringing God into a transaction. Now we will regard all promises as sacred if we remember that all promises are made in the presence of God. Let us pray. God our Father in heaven, thank you for the lesson today, reminding us to always work on truthful communication. Help us to be always mindful that you are watching our speech life and that you will hold us accountable for what we say to others. Give us grace to ensure that our speech will not be frivolous or false that we will be a people of integrity, keeping our promises to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you once again for your time and attention. And if you have been blessed by these studies, please like and share our church Facebook page and YouTube channel. And we will see you in our next lesson. As we continue with James chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, and we will consider what James has to say about the power of prayer, and that will be part one. And to get the best from this Bible study, please read the passages before you join the class. And again, if you have any question at all, please feel free to email us at equip at churchofpraise.org.my. And once again, thank you for your time. God bless you. See you at the next lesson.